So we have now two papers. Uh, the first one is uh, about tracer studies over acidic oxide catalyst and will be presented by Professor Haidt. Joe. Thank you very much. It's a real privilege to be here and to be part of the symposium honoring uh, my dear friend and our wonderful colleague, Keith Paul. Uh, if you, can you hear me at the back or do I need to use the microphone? I'd rather not use it if I don't have to. Okay, I'll speak up. Raise your hand if you can't hear me and I can hear you. <laughs> okay, let me just start off here. Uh, I called uh, this a limited review, perhaps I should have said biased, or uh, perhaps even old. And the review, there's certainly an emphasis on that. So I hope you're not disappointed in uh, not having a lot of real new material in this. Wanted to mention some of the collaborators that uh, I knew. This is work that was begun at Rice at um, Mellon Institute back in the uh, mid-60s and uh, has been continued at Rice. But Bob Gerberick was one of my colleagues on a series of papers. I think the series went up, has gone up to about number 20. I asked Keith if he remembered how many uh, tracer papers there were in his uh, tra tracers and catalysis series. And I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 20. And uh, I was fortunate enough to contribute to a few of those. Bob Gerberick was uh, mentioned on some of the stuff I'll talk about. He and then another person whose name I haven't heard this morning is Fred Allen. The work really could not have been done without Fred Allen. Would you agree, uh, he, that Fred was the technician who uh, was wonderful to work with? I don't see how he kept up with my unreasonable demands, but he did. Other people, some of whom were here, John Larson, uh, John Bett, uh, Noel Camp, heard from this morning, Jeff Wilson and Mary Christner, who unfortunately can't uh, be here today. Objectives of the work that I want to talk about include the following. Uh, I will compare and contrast uh, some olefin isomerization, deuterium exchange reactions and stuff uh, over alumina and over an amorphous silica alumina. No, this is not ZSM something or other. This is simply amorphous silica alumina. It's about a 20%, uh, I'm sorry, about 12% alumina uh, silica material. It is amorphous. It's the old um, Houdry M46, if anybody remembers back that far. This is the work that uh, we began on, and I'll talk about work uh, on that. The other is, uh, for Keith's benefit, was GA48 alumina, uh, which he'll certainly recognize. I want to talk about olefin isomerization and alkyl cyclopropane uh, or cyclopentene uh, work as we go through the talk this morning. We'll be involving both deuterium and carbon-14 isotopic labeled compounds. We'll talk a little bit about the, the origin and the nature and the concentration of active sites for some of these reactions. We'll also begin by focusing on the kinetics and the, the networks and intermediates. Uh, I recall uh, that Keith and I uh, looked at literature work where people had drawn very wrong conclusions based on incomplete kinetic analysis or network analysis of their results. And I'd like to, uh, to sort of begin with that work. The role of carbonaceous residues in some of these reactions and finally, the effect of structure uh, on the isomerization of olefins, particularly over alumina. This is work that uh, most of this work has been published. Now, at the risk of offending uh, Bob, I will uh, cover up part of this down here. I'm sorry about that. But you did it too, so uh, <laughs> I guess I can. Uh, silica alumina is kind of interesting. Uh, all of the reactions that I'll talk about are essentially first order. And this was shown uh, by varying the partial pressure and noting the effect on the rate. So uh, also we have to, this is just to remind people that around room temperature, uh, trans 2 butene, and we're talking about not skeletal isomerization, just talking about the uh, removal cis trans isomerization or shift of the double bond. Uh, one butene is something you order at 4%, uh, cis 2 butene 20%, about 76% uh, would be the trans 2 butene at equilibrium. And in all cases, the rate constants, first order rate constants, were in the ratio of the two 
uh, reactants or products. So it all seemed very consistent thermodynamically and um, kinetically. Now, the thing kind of to notice here over silica alumina near room temperature, we have, in the case of trans tube butenes, two very small arrows that uh, reflect the selectivity. The selectivity, in that case, is essentially unity, almost one to one, one butene to cis butene ratio. The same is true if we began with cis 2 butene, that that arrow and this arrow were also uh, almost the same. And finally, for one butene, the largest arrows are again the same. So the selectivities are roughly unity in the region of room temperature. These do change a little bit, but not all of them. And I want to make a point of that. So, uh, but notice that the selectivities, of course, are not in the thermodynamic ratio. So one of the things here is uh, people have proposed that in going from cis to trans to QT, it, one has to go through the double bond isomerization. So these two rate constants are relatively small, and one might say, well, maybe diffusional effects or something, you know, uh, that they're really not there. This is a disguise. Believe me, they are there. And by using some radioactive tracers, we were able to show, I think, conclusively that uh, that is the case. If one began with cis-2-butene containing a small amount of 1-butene radioactively labeled with carbon-14, we can look at the specific activities of all of the products as a function of conversion of the main component cis-2-butene. I'll come back to what's covered up here, Bob, in a few minutes. But um, let's look at what happens over here if we... Uh, used the reaction network that was shown on the last transparency and looked at the specific activity of the two product compounds. This is beginning with cis with the one butene radioactively labeled. We'll be looking at the buildup of radioactivity in the cis reactant and also in the trans product. Now, if all of the, uh, the trans were formed through the one butene as an intermediate. We would expect to have the initial specific activity of the trans 2 butene to reflect the specific activity of the one butene through which it came. So at zero conversion of the cis 2 butene, we should have an intercept of unity. That will be shown in a minute. Using, however, the uh, small rate constant separating the cis and trans 2 butene transformation we were able to calculate uh, the curves that we should get. These were uh, data points measuring the specific activity. And notice the specific activity of the product trans even exceeds the specific activity of the one butene at various points. Eventually, all of these activities have to come at equilibrium. And for the cis-2 butene, that was 20% conversion. So, uh, or 20%, 80% uh, uh, conversion would be the equilibrium point for the system butene. And I think the agreement there is quite good. Now, if um, one had assumed then that the uh, rate constants between the cis and trans did not exist, here's our unity uh, um, intercept and Notice that there's no correlation between what is predicted and what was actually obtained. These data are the same data as here plotted on a different scale. So I think we've proved uh, very conclusively that for these reactions, all of the pathways do indeed exist. So um, now they do exist, but they change. And that's reflected in the activation energy variables. Notice that with one butene in going to either cis or to trans product, we have the activation energy barriers essentially the same. That means the selectivity does not change from temperature in beginning with uh, one butene. However, in beginning with either of the uh, two butene, cis or trans, there is a difference in activation energy and the selectivities do indeed vary. And I want to make a little bit of a, a point out of that. I think these data can be explained by uh, 
the reactions going through a common surface intermediate. So what we have, regardless of whether we begin with one butene, cis, or trans butene, we have a common surface conflict. So uh, we would really have the rate constants that we have drawn as uh, in connecting with cis and trans one butene directly. Now, they're really, it's more complex than that. And what does this thing look like? Well, I think we can explain it by a classical two-butyl, secondary butyl, carbonium, is what we call it, carbonium ion, carbonium ion intermediate. Where, let me illustrate this with, beginning with uh, a cis two-butene. If we were to add a proton from the surface to, to this position, we were to add it over here, then that would be adding this particular hydrogen A to form the secondary butyl carbonium, carbonium I. So we have essentially a three carbon chain that's parallel to the surface. Now, if we were to lose that hydrogen, the metal group here would fall back into the cis position. So there would be no reaction after forming this. However, if we should lose the hydrogen B, then the methyl group would fall by the principle of least action to the other side and we would have trans. There's only one way to do that. That's losing the HB. Now, on the other hand, we could also form the other product, one butene, by losing either of these three hydrogens. And if you assume that maybe we have free rotation of the uh, methyl group around this bond, then um, you should have then three possibilities, possible ways of forming one butene. Only one way of forming trans. That's not what we see. We saw a selectivity of room temperature that's very near unity. How can we account for that? I think we can account for that by the fact that the, uh, in this case, we're losing a primary um, hydrogen, carbon hydrogen bond. Here we're breaking a secondary bond. They have different energies, and that was shown on the last transparency, where uh, in going from the carbonium ion to uh, the one butene involves a higher activation energy, which means that it would be, uh, there is an energy effect that uh, with approximately about 0.8, if you take an average of these two experimental values, each of which is about plus or minus 0.2. Then you have on the average 0.8, and we factor that in, then it's about one fourth as uh, difficult or as easy to go to the one butene as it is to the trans two butene. So with the statistical effect of three times probability going to one butene, and the energy effect though, taking away from that, it turns out to give one essentially a probability or a uh, selectivity of unity. And the same thing would be true with uh, the trans. So anyway, coming back here, we have the, um, if either losing the one, the HA or the HB, both being secondary uh, carbon hydrogen bonds, the selectivity should be the same because we would have the same exact uh, intermediate if we had started with one butene. So uh, anyway, that accounts for the selectivity. I'd like to draw this in a slightly different way. So here we have uh, an energy diagram where we have the cis and the trans and the one butene. Let's say we start with one butene. We have an activation energy barrier that will be uh, up here, and that is what controls the rate. That's the rate limiting step, but the selectivity will be losing either the HA or the HB to form the trans, the cis or the trans to butene. And those two barriers now are lower by approximately 0.8 kilocalories per mole than uh, the other uh, barrier. And so that means the fact that those two are equal, 
as they should be, both cleavage of a secondary carbon-hydrogen bond, then we would have a one-to-one -one selectivity that is not temperature dependent. On the other hand, starting with cis, as we showed earlier, we would uh, have undergo an activation energy barrier here to get into the well, and then a higher barrier to go to one butene than we would have to go to the trans. So I think that that's a, a kind of an interesting way of uh, talking about what is on the surface and the, some of the surface reactions that take place. Now, we have predicted that one has an inter, I'm sorry, an intra molecular mechanism. If we're adding a proton to the surface, and um, you can look at that by using, again, isotopic tracers. In this case, we began with a mixture of uh, one butene H8 and one butene D8. So a mixture of those, if you, uh, say, add a hydrogen or deuterium and then take away a hydrogen or deuterium, one should have an N ter molecular process and the probability of uh, the H8 species picking up a hydrogen or a deuterium, since we have essentially one to one mixture, would be 0.5. And that seems to be what we get here. We have the uh, molecules, the product molecules, this is actually looking at the, uh, the cis product and uh, from using the one butene. And notice that we have approximately equal amounts of picking up no deuterium, that would be a hydrogen, or a deuterium off the surface. And finally, for, from the deuterated species, either picking up a hydrogen atom or a deuterium uh, would again be about equal. So those um, four species in a perfect world should be the same. This is very close. In fact, it's even closer than it looks because in the starting material, there was already a little bit of D7 in the fully deuterated material. So that accounts for this being slightly higher. It also accounts for this one being slightly higher. So in both the uh, cis and the trans products, we have this inter molecular process taking place. Again, without looking at the surface directly, looking at the products, I think that we can deduce something that went on uh, on the surface. Again, Bob, I'll come back and uncover this in a minute. It's very different with aluminum. Now, another way of looking at this would be to track the uh, hydrogen deuterium exchange as a function of percent conversion. And here we're uh, looking at the isomerization of cis 2 butene in mixture with cis 2 butene fully deuterated. This over here, or over here is plotted the number of atoms that are exchanged per molecule. And notice that both the one butene product, that would be the uh, double bond migration product, and the cis trans rotation product have intercepts in the vicinity of 0.5 at zero conversion, which clearly shows that this is an inter molecular process and that there's a scrambling that goes on. And again, in this particular case, since cis 2 butene was our reactive, the equilibrium conversion would be 80%. So uh, over fairly extensive conversion levels, we still have not that much uh, isotopic scrambling, if you will, among the molecules. Here is our starting material, cis, which can pick up deuteriums or hydrogens depending on uh, undergoing all of these uh, different reactions, conversions to the trans and the cis to the, and the one butene. Now, where do, where do these uh, hydrogens or deuteriums reside? Now, when one starts out, one usually has a silica aluminum with the bronze dead sites on it. And, and a natural suspicion would be that those are themselves the active sites for the reaction. Turns out it, that's maybe not quite correct. And this was studied by taking a molecule that had radioactively labeled uh, carbon and deuterium uh, in the same molecule and passing it in a microcatalytic pulse reactor. We started off with a fresh catalyst uh, with, that contained no deuterium or carbon-14 material. Now, when we uh, pass 
a pulse of any oligo or freshly activated silicon mm -hmm. in the catalyst, two things happen. One, you don't get all the material back. We obviously have a residue left on the catalyst, and um, that causes deactivation. And so what we have now is a C, probably C4, um, and I'm going to exaggerate here, D8N polymer or carbonaceous residue on the surface. When we pass this material over, what do we get? We end up with some product molecules that weren't stuck to the surface. But those materials contain then radioactive carbon and deuterium, but no hydrogen. Essentially, no measurable amount of hydrogen. Which is a bit unsuspecting or uh, a bit surprising. But that simply means, I think, that these protons polymerized part of the uh, the material in the original pulse. Now, if we pass the second pulse over that uh, catalyst, now of just ordinary butene, it doesn't matter which one, we end up with reaction products. No carbon-14 in the products, which means the carbonaceous residue was not displaced. But it did have deuterium, which was not in the original uh, pulse. So it seemed to us, this was a conclusion that was drawn many years ago, that the, uh, the starting material, the original Bronsted sites, were actually too strong, and instead of uh, catalyzing the polymerization or the isomerization reaction, they did catalyze the polymerization on the surface and then provided secondary sites that participated in a more or less steady state type reaction. And that's what would be consistent with this kind of picture. So that was our conclusion uh, in doing that. Now I want to come back, if I may, and take away some of, the, um, some of these pieces of paper. Let's look at the, first of all, Activities were all essentially unity for silica alumina. For trans 2 butene or for the alumina catalyst, that's a very different story. If we look at one butene, the uh, length of the uh, rate constant going to the cis material, cis product, is about five times at room temperature larger than the trans. So this tells us that we have a very selective cis. Uh, catalyst from one butene. Similarly, for the cis two butene, cis forms dominantly the trans product as opposed to the double bond migration product, one butene. And in a very similar way, though, that what we had with the silica lumina there is one pathway, direct interconversion from one butene to trans, appears to have rather small uh, rate constants. By using radioactively uh, labeled tracers, as we did with the silica lumina, this also was shown that these pathways do indeed exist. However, the temperature sensitivities of these are quite different. Where we had the uh, activation energy difference between the uh, cis trans and uh, the double bond migration reaction mechanisms. In the case of alumina now, we have uh, a much larger temperature difference. We're not so worried about the absolute height of these barriers, but the relative heights which are uh, important. And here we see that in going from one butane uh, to either the cis or the trans product, we have uh, very different activation energies and we will have changes in selectivities which did not show up with the silica aluminum. So at higher temperatures, the cis selectivity goes down because it's less temperature dependent as going from one butene to the trans. <clears throat> now, 
Now, that is only part of the story. Another part of the story is that uh, if one uses deuterium, D2 gas, in over an alumina catalyst, that one has uh, considerable deuterium incorporation into the olefins without saturating the olefins. In fact, if one began with one butene in mixture with deuterium gas, one ends up with deuterated one butene right off the bat. And where does that deuterium go? Well, in the case of one butene, it's this hydrogen and these two hydrogens are the three. In fact, these are the most important ones. These uh, exchange much more rapidly with deuterium gas than does this one. But the others don't exchange at all. Absolutely no exchange into the uh, ethyl group uh, on the one butene. Uh, only after the molecule is isomerized do you get exchange. So uh, we thought, well, look, it's a mess when you're starting with butenes and we want to look at this deuterium exchange. Why not start with a molecule that even could isomerize but still give you the same molecule? And so if you started with cis-2-butene and tied this together, you have cyclopentene. And we expected then double bond migration around this thing would allow us to look at what happens, how the deuterium becomes incorporated, and um, at the same time not have to go through a separation. We still have the same material. We can analyze this by microwave spectroscopy or some other way to find out what where the deuterium is located. Well, two things were noticed. On the fresh alumina catalyst, H2D2 exchange is extremely fast. But when we put any olefin molecules in the presence of, uh, or over the catalyst, it kills this particular reaction. Although we still get exchange into the molecule. And in fact, in this case, it was possible for us to prepare greater than 90% isotopically pure 1,2-dibuterocyclopentene. That means that there has been no isomerization in this molecule. And that's strange. This is under the same conditions where, in the case of butenes, you get uh, quite rapid and, uh, 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 isomerization of the butenes. But here it does not happen. So um, based on this, we had a postulate that I would like to mention and then see if we can demonstrate that this actually happens. The postulate or the theory was that double bond migration or isomerization requires a structure where the C3 chain, including the double bond, can appear concave when viewed from outside the molecule. Well, let's see if we can test that. Well, if we look at the cyclopentene, we have the uh, chain involving the double bond but it's not concave, it's convex. No isomerization, so this certainly fits the bill. Now why is this important? Well this might tell us whether we have an intra or an inter molecular mechanism in the isomerization process. And this came from some of the suggestions of the late Herman Pines, where he said that in order to have double bond migration, that you actually have the hydrogen being moved from one location to the other through solution of the hydrogen in the electron cloud, perhaps, of an oxide uh, ion in the, uh, the state. And in our case with alumina, you might have a picture something like this, with an intra-molecular process. So silica alumina gives an inter-molecular. With the alumina, it does appear to be, by and large, intra, although it's a mixed bag. So if we do that, let's now test it with some molecules some molecules that, uh, that we used were the following. Uh, we had uh, used some straight chain or non-cyclic uh, molecules. And we did it with a number of olefins, like starting off with ethene. The four hydrogens in ethene can be exchanged with deuterium. Isomerization is, uh, of course, a moot point here. In the case of propene, all six of the uh, hydrogens can be exchanged, and we have this uh, 
possibility of double bond migration with a concave view for moving the double bond. Now let's take uh, up here with uh, cis or trans to butene again. We have the same possibility of uh, a bisomerization taking place. So that's not a problem, and everything exchanges. Even with isobutene, all eight of the hydrogens are exchanging. Now let's look over here at tertiary um, butyl ethane. In this case, we have only the three hydrogens, the two on this end, one here, as we showed in the last transparency. Only those three are exchangeable. The nine on the uh, isopropyl group, iso, uh, iso tertiary butyl group, are not exchangeable. So we have three of the 12 that can be exchanged. If we go up to uh, normal pentene, again, all 10 of those can be uh, summarized. Now the real, so all of those fit the scheme, fit the theory. What about recyclic olefins? Well, if we take, okay, almost, uh, recyclic olefins, if we started with uh, methylene cyclobutane, we have the possibility of exchanging these two hydrogens, these two, these two is a total of six. But these two up here are not exchangeable and not fit the theory. The same thing is true with whatever molecule we began. Here we've already seen cyclopentane. Now, the real clincher, in my view, is with methyl with other C6 cyclo uh, C5 uh, molecules. With the uh, methylene cyclopentane pentane, we have the possibility of uh, exchanging these two, but not the four out here. That is indeed exactly what happens. And there's a large thermodynamic driving force to give us this molecule. But if we start with a molecule like, and this is the last one, the, uh, this molecule will not isomerize. It's very much like the cyclopentene. Indeed, we get only two of the ten hydrogens they can exchange. So anyway, conclusion that they are that uh, that silica alumina are and alumina are very different catalysts. Silica alumina, the double bond migration, and cis trans rotations are inter molecular processes where uh, with the alumina it's probably more intra. Finally, alumina requires a special molecular geometry for isomerization to occur. And I didn't get to this point, but the final thing and most important is congratulations to Keith on his 80th birthday and thanks for being such an excellent mentor, Keith. Thank you very much. Time for a couple of short questions. Yes. Please. I was wondering how heterolytic is that hydrogen transfer over the aluminum? That's a very good question. How heterolytic is the transfer? I cannot say does it go as a hydride ion or is it as a hydro, uh, hydrogen atom? I don't know. Yes. Okay. Thank you again.